A big shout out goes to Maxis Tires, Jensen USA, and Fox Shocks for supporting the inside line. Welcome, mountain bikers. Great to see you. You too, virtually. Yeah. Yep, yep. It's been a year. Mm. I, a year, Darren. A year. Should that... I just kick it off? Should we get into this? Sure. All right. Welcome back, mountain bikers. It's been a year since Darren, who you see here, and Jason Schroeder and I recorded a podcast about the new push fork. We're going to put new in air quotes. The new yeah. push fork. We recorded that a year ago. And for all you listeners out there, it's launched today, obviously. What we're going to do is revisit that first interview, and then we'll speak with Darren about what's changed and hopefully get some answers to fill in any of the gaps, any of the questions. But Darren, are you ready? Yeah, I'm, I am more than ready. All right, I'm ready too. All right, let's jump into the first interview and we'll be right back. Welcome mountain bikers. Thanks for tuning into the Inside Line podcast. I'm your host, Sean Spomer, and I'm here with Jason Schroeder, Vital MTB tech editor. And we have a returning guest today, <laughs> Mr. Darren Murphy of Push Industries Yay. with something pretty special over his left shoulder. <laughs> There's a push fork back there. What are we looking at? Is that what that is? Rider left. Yeah, that is um, the long talked about or rumored push fork. So it's finally, uh, it's, it's finally here. You know, you guys are seeing it for the first time and, um, yeah, we're really excited to talk about it. Really excited to show it because, um, as I mentioned, even today on the trail, you know, it's, it's been a lot of work. We've had, um, a lot of time on it ourselves mm -hmm. and we're excited to get other people on it. Yeah. And Jason, you wrote it today. I did. Yeah. I had the pleasure of doing so. So I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit. Yeah, yep. sure. For sure. Let's just start with it. How long has this been in the process? I mean, last time we were talking about this, you and I were, you came over in 2019. Is that what we thought? I think 18. Okay. 18 or 19. Yeah. Yeah. And did, did that episode yeah. and you showed me a picture of, it was like a CAD drawing, I yep. guess back then, but it's been a long time and now we're finally here. Like, yeah. Give us, give us some background on what's going on with this thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, obviously the, the short story that people know, you know, push was the suspension tuning company. We tuned forks and shocks. Uh, then we designed and engineered, manufactured our own shock. Um, so then the natural progression, of course, as soon as we started with a rear shock, customers immediately went to, Oh, awesome. So when's the fork coming? <laughs> The fork is a much bigger project. And I would say that with rear shocks, we had a really good handle on, we, we made a lot of um, larger design components when we were a tuning company. So for rear shocks, it was a little easier for us to transition into, you know, like, hey, we're gonna make our own. Not that it was easy, but we had a little bit more background. Mm -hmm. With a front fork, the first thing is it's a structure, right? It's supporting, the front wheel and steering tube, you know, it's, it's, it's a structure to start with. And it's like, well, what would you do? What is the best fork? You know, what is the, and I think honestly, if you go back to that 2015, 2016, when we were actually getting serious about developing a fork, um, I think that mountain bike forks in general, were still going through a lot of development, right? We hadn't settled in on the maybe even the ride categories, you know, mm -hmm. like enduro versus trail versus, you know, whatever all the different categories are. Um, so for us, it was just like, Hey, if we were going to build a fork, what would it be? And what is the best way to do it? And, um, yeah, so that's where we started. So we started what ended up being a very long journey down the road of what's going to make the best fork. You know, should it be conventional? Should it be inverted? Should it be big stanchions, small stanchions? You know, uh, the, the list is huge. <laughs> okay. Okay. Big question. Yeah. Why upside down versus conventional as we've been calling it today? Yeah. Um, like I mentioned for us, uh, you know, we wanted to build something special. Obviously we are largely an aftermarket company. And so we, we don't have the constraints that some of the OEM manufacturers have from a timing, from a cost, you know, all those things that's proven with our rear shock, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so with the front fork, um, we don't have OE constraints. We're an aftermarket company. So let's build what is best. And so 
we did conventional, inverted, linkage. Um, you know, I think the linkage fork has been leaked out there a little bit, you know, like some of the CAD renderings and stuff like that. We've, we've built all kinds of different things. We've tested everything, you know, trying to sort it down. And, and, you know, for us, it was really a question of why do mountain bikes use what they use and why do motorcycles use what they use, you know? So why, when you look at supercross, motocross, uh, GNCC enduro racing, MotoGP, World Superbike, you know, like whenever you look at motorcycles, they're all inverted. Every performance suspension fork is inverted. So when you look at the shocks, there's monotube and twin tube shocks in moto, right? That's, that's what you get. Okay, so there's monotube and twin tube shocks in mountain bike. There's monotube and twin tube in motorcycle. Well, in motorcycle, there's pretty much all inverted, but yet mountain bikes are all conventional. Why is that? And so for us, that was the kind of the first thing is, is we had a lot of experience with conventional forks, you know, with rock shocks and Fox forks and everything else. Didn't have much experience with inverted because what are you going to, who has one? Mm -hmm. And so, um, we just looked at it and said, what would make the best possible product and why let's understand, let's talk to motorcycle engineers. Let's talk to motorcycle suspension people. I have a lot of experience personally in motorcycle suspension uh, prior to starting push, but let's learn, let's understand like why, why, why an inverted fork? I mean, everybody throws out, there's a few things in the mountain bike industry. Oh, inverted forks, the seals and foam rings are always lubricated and that's good. But the forks are torsionally, um, not as, not as stiff and that's bad. And so we can't use them. Well, we wanted to kind of expand that and say, hmm, where, where are the boundaries? What is good? What is bad? Let's ask a lot of questions. Let's build some stuff. Let's see. Let's just build it and ride it and see what happens. And at the end of the day, um, we could build either one. We could go conventional. We could go inverted. Um, the invert was the way to go from all out performance. If it was not a factor of manufacturability, assembly, cost, like what is going to be the best product? It's the invert. Did you build a conventional prototype or anything? No. Um, we built some systems, but we never built the conventional fork. Um, we designed a conventional fork, just like we designed a linkage fork. We played around with different linkage concepts. Um, we've done a lot of things, but we never, we never went through because it's one of those where we built some systems and started looking at things. And every single time on the design table, well, first off, we had a bunch of really excellent conventional forks. Let's, let's just be clear about this, that the conventional forks that are on the market today are awesome, right? Hats off to the, the um, Fox and Rock Shocks of the world because they do an amazing job building what they built. We're a different, we're a different animal, obviously. So we had great conventional forks to draw from already. So the idea of us making a better conventional fork, I don't think, you know, we don't have an ego to where it's like, oh, you know, if we were to build a conventional fork, it would be amazing. It's like, no, they, they already make really good conventional forks, but there's no really dedicated invert fork. And so that's where we kind of focused all of our resources was to say, okay, if we were to build that level, like at, at the level that current conventional forks are, if we were to build that or better in an invert, what would it, what would it be? Before we get into the tech and kind of the development, yep. can you give us just some of the general spec of what the fork is? Yeah, so it's it's really, this is the first fork we're building. It's geared towards the trail market. So same customer as our 11.6 rear shock, right? So we really, um, that sweet spot for us is that 140 to 170 trail bike. That's mm -hmm. what this fork is. So this is, uh, a, you know, 140 to 170 trail bike or EMTB uh, trail fork. So it works on um, EMTBs as well. The travel... 140 to 170 can be adjusted in 10 millimeter increments. Um, so anywhere, 140, 150, 160, 170. Uh, that's your flavor. It's uh, coil sprung, obviously. So for us, we didn't do an air fork. We built a coil fork. So it uses a more advanced version of our ACS3 coil system. So we use a coil spring for the main spring, and then we have a air bump stop inside that can be externally adjustable. Um, so high low speed compression externally, rebound, um, externally. And, uh, yeah, it's, 
it's just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's really geared towards that 140 to 170 trail bike market, uh, aggressive trail. Like it's for getting rowdy. That's what it's, that's what it's designed for. Yeah. Talk about some of the unique features, like the way the, the dropouts work and yep. just some of the unique things. Brake mounts. Yeah. Bleeders. Yeah. Yeah. So for us, um, yeah, the, the big thing was, well, first off, let me just say, I, I know the, the burning question. Everybody's first thing is going to be like torsional stiffness. Mm -hmm. You know, you stick the tire uh, between your legs and you turn the handlebars. I just want everybody out there to know that is the very first thing that we focused on, right? <laughs> so, so just to be clear, um, the whole like uh, twisting test. Um, yeah, we've, we've gone through that whole process and understand, you know, what works and what doesn't. All right. Since, since we're there, I want, <laughs> I want you to go through the story with the moto engineers you talked about regarding that, like, let's just get it out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, um, again, if you go back to what we were discussing earlier for us, it was really about understanding why can, why do all these motorcycles do it successfully? And it's, we can't do it successfully on a mountain bike. That doesn't make sense. And so, yeah, I've just kind of talked to a bunch of, um, for, you know, talked to some former colleagues, talked to some industry, you know, moto industry friends that connected me with different engineers and different people. And we also had our own internal epiphanies about this as well. But yeah, a big part of it was when you're discussing, uh, like grabbing the front tire and twisting the handlebars with the guys in moto, you know, they just look at you like, this is, they don't understand why you're asking them that, you know? Yeah. So like when you put the wheel between your legs and then you yard on the bars right. and see how, how twisty it is. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And, and they're just, the, the first question becomes, well, what, what are you doing? Is it, is this a trials fork or, you know, like why, when are you in that situation? You know, it's like, well, you're not, but that's, you know, you can twist it. And so then it's like, well, no, that's not, that's not what's holding the wheel. The wheel's being held by the, on the bottom of the tire. Right. Mm. So to make that test even legitimate, it's not a legitimate test, but even to make it legitimate, you'd have to actually grab your feet at the bottom of the wheel and then realize, oh, you don't have anywhere near the kind of leverage you do when you're grabbing the front of the wheel. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, it was just one of those kind of funny things where it's like, well, they would never consider doing that because it's not realistic for anything. Like it never, unless, you know, you're smashing to the back of somebody or, or something like that. So. So yeah, that was kind of an eye opener. It's like, wait a minute, you don't grab the front, you'd have to grab the bottom. And then when you're talking about the friction, how that could happen, it really is the tire, right? So the, the, the tire would move before the fork tubes would, you know, the tire is so much mm -hmm. more um, or less rigid than the fork that it's going to, the rubber is going to move before that would ever happen. And then, um, so you start to look at those things differently and then you start to realize that torsional flex can sometimes be your friend, uh, because it has some, I don't know, malleability to it. If that's a word, you know, where, t where you come through terrain and the thing can be off camber and, and do different things and kind of naturally kind of follow the ground, which we saw mm -hmm. today, you know? Yeah. Um, so anyway, but yeah, the torsional thing, uh, it was a big focus of ours. It was the very first priority that we looked at and tried to solve. And, and honestly, our first thought, we have to solve it. So not, we have to eliminate it, right? So we thought in our minds, we have to make, and we actually designed a system that uh, kind of uh, locked the tubes. So the very first prototype that we built, the tubes couldn't rotate. They were actually mm -hmm. locked, kind of like a, sort of like a head shock right? If you've ever seen how like the lefties or the head shocks had mm -hmm. kind of keyed, they were flat surfaces that bearings rode on. So we, we didn't do exactly that, but we actually did the very first prototypes we built had locked tubes and we were able to, um, remove that lock as well. So we could test it back and forth. And we qu quickly, quickly realized that, um, not only did the locked tube not really add any performance, um, but again, it was just another one of those insights where it's like, wait, we're trying to solve something that may not actually be, we think it's an issue, just like the whole marketplace. I think if you ask anybody who understands a little bit about inverted forks and mountain biking, that's the first thing they go to. Oh, mm -hmm. they're flexy. And so we're like, Hey, we have to solve it. Well, it turns out you don't have to solve it. What you have to do is figure out how to make it work for you and you know, where to tune it, where to tune the flex, where to make it because you certainly can make it so it, it's bad. Mm -hmm.
but you have to learn how to make it work for you. And that's what we've spent an exhaustive amount of time developing was how do we build a chassis that actually, you know, works. It's purposeful. Yeah. Which is why you see our kind of dual single crown design. You know, you see the crown, you know, wraps down and that, that was an area where we needed increased stiffness. You know, we learned about how the fork doesn't actually twist. It actually does this. And so we're actually controlling this kind of fore aft, not the actual twisting of the tubes. And so adding stiffness in certain areas to, to tune that out. Um, but at the end of the day, accepting that, no, the torsional flex is actually beneficial. A lot of what you feel in hard cornering and kind of chattering or the wheel feeling like it's pushing out is because of things being too stiff. And if you can make that thing track a little bit nicer, like a mechanical, a mechanical grip almost, mm -hmm. it's better. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've looked at everything. Yeah. yeah. All right. Back to some of the unique features like yep. the dropout or the, uh, yeah. yeah, the dropouts and, um, yeah, the bleeder valves, the, the brake mount, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. So the inverted fork definitely opens up, uh, some features, which are real nice. You know, one of them was we obviously looked at, Hey, we're going to build a fork. We have to be 27.5 and 29. You know, mm -hmm. we still have a lot of customers that run 27.5. Um, the head of our R&D program rides 27.5, you know, 27.5 isn't dead, you know, so it's still legitimate <laughs> in our world, in our world, 27.5 is still here. And so uh, that led to the dropout design. So we actually have uh, removable axle lugs, so that we call them axle lugs. And the axle lugs on this fork are removable. And so that just means that if you start off on a 27.5 fork and you buy a new bike and you want to go 29, you can literally replace the axle lugs and convert it to 29. So adjust the offset and the, um, the height and everything. Uh, the other thing too, is as the industry changes and bikes change, you know, going from a 51 millimeter to a 49 millimeter to a 44 millimeter, you know, like mm -hmm. offsets may not necessarily be locked down just yet. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, we have that flexibility too. So even if you have a 29 or 44 millimeter offset and all of a sudden 46 millimeter becomes the hot new thing that you have to have, you can swap out the axle lugs. So just changing the axle lugs instead of having to buy a new fork or whatever, it's like, it's, it's a relatively straightforward thing to do. And it's something that, um, users can do. We don't have, we don't have to do it at a service center, for instance. Uh, that was one. Another one that seemed reasonable to us is, uh, brake adapters. You know, we, we have demo bikes and test bikes and we're constantly, you know, changing forks and this and that. And, um, Another thing that just seemed to make sense was having a um, brake system built in the axle lug where it accommodated both 180 and 200 millimeter rotors with one mount. And so uh, we use a, we have a, a design where you can put either a 180 or a 200 mil rotor on there with no brake adapter. And so it um, just, your caliper just bolts up straight to it. So that was something that Again, it's a cost thing, so it's more expensive to do it that way. But for us, it was just kind of cleaner to have a caliper that just, hey, it just mm -hmm. directly bolts up and you can go through between rotors and not have to chase down, um, you know, a brake adapter. Mm -hmm. And I know it's frustrating for consumers too. Like you buy a brand new fork and you're so pumped, right? It's Friday, you got your new fork, this and that. And then all of a sudden, oh, my brake doesn't bolt up to it. <laughs> I need a, you know, I need a different adapter. Mm -hmm. Like these are real world things that, that we hear, you know, that, that yeah. frustrate people. Yeah. So yeah, we've got the, um, uh, the, the cool brake system. So 180 and 200 standard rotor, uh, bolt up, uh, the travel adjust, as I mentioned earlier, like is something you can do at home as well. So we've kept, uh, the internal travel adjust system is pretty unique. It doesn't require new parts. And so it, you can take the plunge, what we call the plunger rod, the spring plunger rod out and reposition it in 10 millimeter increments on the rod yourself. And so no special tools, um, it kind of, uh, the top cap clips, you slide into position, lock in the pin, clip it back down. And you now have a 150 fork when you had a 160 or yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So making, uh, that travel adjust, um, springs, you know, we offer nine different spring rates, five pound per inch increments. Um, so getting the, getting on the correct rate, like the fine, like a nice fine tuned rate, because, you know, air forks are very popular for their ease of, uh, fine adjustments, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, Hey, I can just add a little air pressure, et cetera. So we do have the air bump stop, which goes from zero to 30 PSI to control the ending stroke. It controls both 
how soon it comes in and how hard it comes in. So you can adjust the end stroke progression. And then with the springs, again, you just have that, that real fine tuned control. If you want to experiment, if you want to test new things, or if you're someone who, you know, like right now we're in SoCal, this is your local, you know, trail riding, but you do a Whistler trip every year, or you do a Moab trip or something like that, where you're mm -hmm. riding different terrain, the ability for you to just have a, you know, one spring rate firmer for that type of riding and to be able to switch it out again, just in your garage. Yeah was really, really important to us. Hmm. So yeah, yeah, that's a cool one. Cool. The, you mentioned servicing, yeah. um, like changing the oil and stuff. Can you discuss yeah. that a little bit? Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. I keep turning away from the mic, yeah. but yeah. And so in the back of the fork legs, uh, again, one of our engineers, kind of a clever guy, we, uh, you know, we have bleeding systems that we use for, for building our rear shocks. And he just thought, Hey, why don't I just put a bleeding, a bleed port into the fork in a position where we can just draw out the fluid and, um, you know, drain all the excess stuff and put new stuff in. So we do have kind of a quick service capability with this fork where on the back of the fork leg, there's some uh, set screw that you remove. You hook up the syringe with the bleed fitting, um, pop the little, uh, valve at the top and you can just draw out all the old oil, just suck it right out vacuum it out, uh, dispose of that and then fill the syringe with freshie screw it back on, pop that valve again, and then just push in your uh, new lubricating fluid. Um, you don't even have to take the fork off the bike. You don't even have to take the wheel off the bike. Mm -hmm. You know, you can just kind of literally just do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of a, that's a kind of a clever little feature. Um, and again, because, you know, one of the big advantages, as we all know, with invert forks is the foam rings and the oil seals are always submerged in oil. Mm -hmm. That's what you know, that's why they're so buttery smooth. That's why they're always perfectly lubricated. And so uh, being able to take advantage of that feature and having clean fluid that you can just do easily, it's something where, you know, every couple of months, it, it's just not a drag. Like you, you're like, you know, yeah. I just feel like changing up my fluid right now yeah. because it's easy. Mm -hmm. You just do it. And so you have this great lubrication system based on the design of the fork. And then you have this ease at which to change the fluid. And it's like, yeah, it just keeps it. I think most people, after you do like a lower leg service, you know, you generally are like, Whoa, man, this thing feels great. You know? <laughs> wow. You know? So for people who've had that experience, imagine yeah. just being able to, you know, do a quick draw on the fluid. Just yeah. like, Hey, let me take out the old stuff and put some new stuff in. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, there's different fluids, different lubricity. It's winter time. That's the other thing where we live in Colorado, you know, during the winter, we tend to use a thinner fluid, mm -hmm. um, because you get some, some, uh, almost a damping effect from the fluid being so, so viscous. Yeah. And so that's another thing. If you live in a climate like ours where, Hey, it's coming up on cold temps. I just want to put, you know, two and a half weight in there instead of seven and a half weight, you know? So the seven and a half weight's really nice. Cause it's, it's, it's nice and gooey and smooth and all that stuff. But in the winter time, it's like molasses. So mm -hmm. let me just change that out. It's little things like that. Yeah. You know, it just, that's what we deal with. Again, being an aftermarket company, we talk to end users all the time. So, mm -hmm. um, not that the other guys don't, but I think we have a really strong database of customer feedback to draw from that. And that's where some of these features come from. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to comment on kind of that matched with the ability to just travel it, you know, 10 mil increments, the ability to change what front wheel size you're using, what yeah. brake mount, like all of the kind of modularity of it yeah. is awesome for like end user. Yeah. I mean, we'll probably get to, the price point it hit because you know it <laughs> it, 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 it it's on brand um but like and that's kind of you guys all whole mo is that once you get on one of your products the yeah. whole idea is that you'll have it for a long time right and that opens the door for you know you have a fork you can apply to multiple bikes over time yeah and i think that's rad it's really cool yeah it's it's there's a lot of reasons we do it mm -hmm. um a, the number, the driving focus is customers, right? Mm -hmm. Customer experience is everything to us. And, um, in today's day and age, it's not bicycle based. It's just global products, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't matter what it is. Things have become disposable in this world and it doesn't matter what the price, you know, super expensive things are still disposable to a certain degree. And so part of it is that where we're like, Hey, we, we want the customer experience to be something that isn't disposable, that doesn't come out next year with a new version of it. And now you've got the old one or whatever. So, um, you know, I was telling you guys the story this morning, we had serial number 17 from, uh, May of 2015, uh, shock come in for service, mm -hmm. you know, and we're stoked that, 
you know, if a shock from 2015 comes into push and gets serviced, mm -hmm. you know, and gets fresh everything. And even the anodized knobs that are kind of dull, we mm -hmm. put fresh dials. And so that's a big part. And I think um, in today's day and age, it's socially responsible, you know, to, to mm -hmm. not be disposable. Um, you know, we, we are a manufacturer. We create a lot of stuff. And um, so we create a lot of metal chips and recycling. And so we're, we see what goes into not that other companies don't, but we, we have a first hand view of the materials and the fluids and all the things that go into manufacturing something. And so I, we definitely have a responsibility as a company where we look at it and say, we don't want to make something that gets thrown away. We don't want it to go into landfill. We don't want it to be recycled. How can we sell someone a really awesome product, provide a great customer experience and something that lasts, you know, that they feel like they're invested in. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay, made in the USA, just like your shocks are, right? Yeah. In Colorado, let's get to the price and let's get to the weight because, you know, those are usually <clears throat> some of the first two questions, right? How much does it cost? How much does it weigh? Yeah. Uh, price is 2,600 US. And again, it kind of goes back to uh, kind of our DNA. We, much like with our rear shocks, much like with everything we do, we always look at how can we potentially lower costs and with this product, we did the same thing. You know, we, we look at changing materials, doing different things. And at the end of the day, we, we always end up compromising the performance. And so, um, we've kind of stopped doing that now. You know, we just decided like we, we put all this effort into it and it never works out. So yeah, 2,600, uh, us, um, you're getting a hand built fork. It's just like our rear shock program, right? You're getting something that we make, we manufacture, we assemble, like the whole process is in house. And so we have quality, our own quality checks along the way. We have our people's eyes on it. You know, it's something where it's bespoke and developed by us and built by us and sold by us. And, um, yeah, having operations here in the U S as everyone knows is, is far more expensive. Um, it's a decision we made years and years ago and we've stuck to it and, uh, there's no turning back at this point. So, um, it's a, if you're looking, if you're a customer that's looking for the best product and the best product experience, um, that's, that's what we're bringing. Okay. And how much do you weigh? So this version is, uh, comparable in weight to a 38 millimeter fork, but it has full coil. So that's, that's the advantage that we have. So, um, so, you know, this morning as we were talking and you know, asking you about why the costs are so high and what the challenges were to get it to perform yeah. the way you wanted to. The, the construction and the manufacturing process is fairly interesting with the bonding that you do. Nothing's pressed in. Can you kind of help exp or just explain why it's so tricky to make? Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, again, you know, we kind of sp spoke about this this morning about how we, bond the upper assembly together, you know, the steering tube into the crown. We're familiar with, you know, creaking crowns and all of these things. So, um, again, no secret, you know, we, we acknowledge those things exist. We didn't want that to happen to us. We've learned, you know, why it happens and how to prevent it. Uh, for sure. Our, our upper structure. So the whole upper structure is aluminum. It's all machined. Um, the crown is, uh, made out of a huge billet block of aluminum. Um, so the machine time on that thing is, well, the material cost is huge because aluminum is so expensive these days. Uh, but the time it takes just to make the crown is, is really huge. Um, there's a lot of labor because this isn't, it's not press fit together. Um, because it's not press fit and we're actually uh, bonding everything together, we have to have, we actually designed and engineered and manufactured our own mold systems. So we actually, these go into kind of a mold slash jig system that gets the alignment right, because that's a, that's a big thing. Um, and I think that's been a talking point for the last couple of years for sure. Right. People have realized that the alignment bushing tolerances, all of these things are really critical to get a mountain bike fork work really well. Mm -hmm. And with the inverted fork, you know, we have a, a lot of really long tubes. Um, and so getting that upper structure straight, parallel, you know, like the precision it takes to, that's one of the things with an inverted fork. It is a bit, it's more difficult to make than the conventional forks, you know, with a one piece casting, you know, the lower leg casting magnesium, 
you cast it, you can come back, post machine it, put your bushings in. The bushings can be um, adjusted. You know, you can tweak and burnish and do things to the bushings to kind of work with the alignment. We have less of that capability. So for us, it has to be kind of square out of the assembly jig. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things that, you know, it costs more to do that. It, it's just, again, if we were going to build it, we were going to build it right. Mm -hmm. And when you have like a moto fork with dual crowns, um, it's, it's easier to kind of fudge the alignment, not fudge, I shouldn't say fudge, but getting the alignment sorted mm -hmm. is easier when you have dual, dual crowns and things are bolted together. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about making a one piece upper assembly, um, that doesn't, you can't manipulate it after it's put together. It's like, it's, it either is or it isn't. Mm. And so the precision that we hold, the tolerances that we hold for the alignment of that upper assembly is really, really tight, which is why we get, again, just great small bump sensitivity. We get, get the stiffness that we're looking for, but it's a super labor intense process. You know, we've got machined aluminum tubes that are machined to very high tolerances. And then we have these jigs and fixtures and molds and different things that the upper assembly has to go into to make sure that it, you know, sets perfectly straight. And that's the first thing that we have to do, right? That, that all that does is gets us the upper assembly. <laughs> so before we, before we do anything else, like we've got to go through that whole process mm -hmm. <laughs> and much like carbon bikes, you know, I was saying to you guys this morning, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things with carbon is it just is so labor intense and the manufacturers, there's just no way around it. You have to have people laying carbon into the molds and, you know, by hand, that's just the way that process works. And same thing, like this upper structure, it's not something we can automate or, I mean, at this point, it's, it's not even on our radar to be able to automate it because it's really, it's, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, white glove type service and someone who's really focused on building that thing. Sure. Sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> Was it the Marzocchi? Was it the rack or the RAC? Yeah. It was an upside down one. Yep. Was that a one piece like kind of like an inverted, like a one piece magnesium. I think that might've been carbon. Was it carbon? I think Marzocchi mm. back in the day, that red kind yeah, of uh -huh. fork. Yeah. yeah. I think that might've been a one piece carbon structure. I okay. believe the, um, uh, what's it called? RS one, you know, that mm -hmm. RockShock tried that RS one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was, I think, wasn't that one piece of carbon? So. Yeah. I okay. think that was carbon. Okay. Um, so it's, it's been done that way, but does it just not, work as well? Like, do you have any idea? I think, you know, so I'll disclose that we started in carbon, um, because we thought that was the way to go. Um, and there was big challenges. The alignment ruled it out pretty quick. Hmm. So we met with, um, you know, some carbon people. We met with some different people, we met with Joe Stanish from, uh, C3, you know, the guys are doing all the fu fiber fusion fiber or fiber fusion, mm -hmm. you know, wheels and all that stuff. And everybody kind of looked at what we were trying to build and it was like, Oh wow, that's, <laughs> <sighs> you want to try to do what? Mm -hmm. And, um, so for us, we abandoned carbon pretty early because all the experts said what you're trying to achieve. We, we don't feel confident achieving that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, that's why we, that's why we ended up with an aluminum upper structure. So I don't know, cause I, I to be honest, I haven't looked at an RS1 very closely. I definitely haven't looked at that Marzocchi very closely, mm -hmm. but I think that in carbon, I know for us and what, what we looked at, the experts we talked to, um, we couldn't get carbon to meet our tolerance, you know, demands basically. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And we, and that's the thing, right? So, um, we don't know because we never built the carbon and maybe we could have made it work, but we did know that through what we learned, the alignment and having that upper structure built a specific way was going to be the found. It is, it's the foundation for making the whole for fork work, work right. And so we weren't going to compromise with that. And then, like I said, once we started building the aluminum stuff um, and prototyping it ourselves and controlling that tolerance, we were getting the results that we wanted. And so, we never look back. We just cool. said, this is, that's, this is the way we're going to go. Yeah. Yep. All right. The guts what's inside. Um, so yeah, uh, left leg is coil spring. It's kind of an advanced version of our ACS three. So our ACS three coil kit was super six or still is, I guess, uh, very successful, but it was designed to retrofit into somebody else's chassis. So having a clean sheet of paper, we were able to take our 
that concept of having coil spring, air bump stop, plunger system, and just refine it so it's much lighter, much more robust, much cleaner. Um, so that's what's in the left leg. In the right leg, we've got a pressurized uh, damper with an internal floating piston. One thing that's really interesting is the compression system is not only like what we use in the rear shock, it is what we use in the rear shock. So the valve system that is in our 11.6 rear shock is what is at the heart of this front fork. And so it literally is the valve system, um, not, not a copy, not a replica, not like a, a different version, um, which is something that our engineers worked on. Uh, again, really clever because they were able to basically utilize that 11.6 valve and tune the cartridge and the rebound system. And so it basically, they built an 11.6 shock damper inside the fork. <laughs> and so uh, what we have is the same architecture as what we have in our rear shock. So the valve system, the rebound system, the IFP, the what is in our 11.6 rear shock literally is what is inside of our front fork. So on the compression, it is the exact compression unit. And the, on the rebound side, it has to be scaled down. We can't use the, the same piston diameter we use in our rear shock, but the architecture, the design, the tunability, the way it works, it's, it's identical. And so um, I think that's one of the things, you know, for you guys today, you got to ride the package. You got to ride the fork and the shock. And so that's a unique experience because it's so well balanced. So part of any good suspension, it's not, you know, if it's too stiff, if it's too soft, if it's too fast, too, it doesn't matter as long as the front and rear do the same thing. It's mm -hmm. really easy to ride a bike where the front and rear are doing the same thing, even if it's not optimized. So you can take a fork that's super optimized and a rear shock that's out of balance, and that's not going to work as well as a bike that's set up too soft, but is doing the same thing front to rear. And so for us, we've been able to really ratchet that up because we have that same architecture, the same spring system, the same kind of bottoming system. Um, the same new bottoming bumper system that we have on our rear shock is in the front fork. So our ACS has the air bump stop along with a mechanical bump stop inside. Um, same compression valve, same rebound system. So the ride is, you know, the, the, the way you tune it, everything is the same. So if you want to make tuning changes to the rear shock, you can make those same changes to the front fork and get the same exact result. So it makes for a, for a unique system. So the damper is, is something very unique. It works, um, the compression and rebound levels and the way it performs is completely different than anything that's on the market. Yeah. yeah. And Jason, you got to have basically the equivalent of a run or two <laughs> on it today, but we'll call it that. Yeah. yeah. Speak to how it felt on the trail. Um, hopefully you liked I, it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know. Right. I'm like, well, it's, it's kind of like, where do you start? I feel like there's a few different avenues I could go down. I think probably the first one is instead of using flex when talking about an inverted yeah. fork, I like compliance. I like that word yeah. a little bit better. Yeah. seems less negative connotation, whatever, whatever you want to call it. But, uh, we talked a lot about that before we went and rode and that was in, in a positive way, like the most noticeable maybe aspect of the bike uh, or of the fork is, um, yeah, just, we didn't really touch on it and maybe this is a good time to touch on it is yeah. talking about the parking lot test of yeah. when you push down on this fork versus a conventional fork yep. and how that applies on trail, because that was the biggest difference I noticed. Maybe yep. you want to touch on that first. Yeah, for sure. So <clears throat> again, as, as, uh, part of this, we kind of learned a lot about the leverage and, you know, mm -hmm. bushing overlap leverage, bushing bind and how that really impacts the overall uh, feel of the fork. And so one thing that's interesting, a, a modern conventional fork, when you're pushing on the handlebars, you're driving the inner tubes into the outer. And so you have kind of this direct leverage from the handlebar. And with the inverted fork, it's very unique because when you're pushing on the handlebars, you're actually pushing the outer over the inner tube. Um, it's, you know, it's completely backwards, right? <laughs> and so, um, you know, that's something where, you know, a lot of people talk about like the sprung and unsprung mass effect, right? So a mm -hmm. lot of times when you talk about inverted forks, it's like, oh yeah, there's, you know, less sprung mass. So it's more reactive, which those things are true, but actually what is a bigger benefit is that leverage point. And so, yes, if you take and push on this fork on the handlebars, it doesn't, it's not like that silky smooth, like super, mm -hmm. you know, compliant feel. Mm -hmm. 
until you like take the fork and push the wheel up against something and then push it. And then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, this thing comes alive. Or if you flip the bike upside down and push from the wheel instead of the handlebar, it's like, oh, this thing's crazy compliant. And so that was another big eye opener for us. And what you experienced today obviously mm-hmm. was that the bumps are coming from the bottom, yeah. right? So while we do parking lot tests and we drive the fork, you know, drive the inner tubes into the outer and, um, you know, are constantly like, you know, put, holding the brakes and pushing on things. That's not the, what the bumps are doing. The mm-hmm. bumps are coming from the bottom up. And so when you look at the amount of bushing overlap that we get in the in- inverted fork, and when you look at the way the leverage works with this long upper structure supporting everything, it, you just, you get a, a more, com- I like the com- compliancy. You mm-hmm. get more compliancy. You get just a more natural tendency, tendency to have the terrain muted because mm-hmm. the leverage point is where the bump is coming from. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a big difference. So for sure, I'll tell you right now that, um, our fork in a parking lot, uh, will not compete with the current crop of mountain bike forks. Mm-hmm. That being said, our fork off road will definitely compete mm-hmm. with everything that's out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we don't ride our bikes in the parking lot all yeah. the time, right. <laughs> but it's natural, right? What do we all, yeah. I mean, listen, every, Every kind of serious mountain biker, first thing you do when you go up to a bike, squeeze brake levers, right? We mm-hmm. all like, oh, do that. And then we always yeah. push up and down the <laughs> fork, push up and down the seat. It's just the natural, you know, thing that we do. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's where we will, we acknowledge we will lose that battle as the parking lot battle. <laughs> we will win the off-road battle. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And maybe that's part of it too. And maybe that's, and I mean, I don't know, but you know, from a, consumer perspective or maybe that's why conventional forks have continued to be so good because for sure like these these don't feel as good on a showroom floor they don't feel Mm. as good in a parking lot you know yeah so it's interesting to me because you can go grab whatever fork is currently on your bike and do that obscure grab your wheel twist and there's still flex in your fork like it's Mm -hmm. not like what you're currently riding isn't flexing and i would argue a lot of stuff i ride nowadays maybe isn't flexing or isn't as compliant as you want in all situations. Right. And that was, I'm sure we'll be overlaying the section of trail that we shot today, but if you're just listening, it was basically a, a straight rock garden with repeating compressions that were pretty aggressive and yeah. um, muted is a really good word to kind of describe it. But when we did back and forth with my personal bike, that I have a uh, 38 on Fox 38 and then riding the push fork and just the, kind of fore and aft jarringness of a 38 versus this just more um mirroring the ground and not feeling as much of like those impacts was probably like the biggest difference like the magic carpet kind of feeling that yeah it's it's kind of hard to explain because it is it felt really different from a lot of stuff i've ridden but yeah. in a good way it was never it wasn't flexy but it was not stiff in a good way it was like when you want your when you want your suspension to feel like it's not binding it's doing what it wants to i felt like this did a much better job of that where a lot of stuff i've been riding you know in the last couple years maybe struggles to kind of match that traction with absorbing bumps and maybe a little bit of comfort if that's what you're after as well um yeah it was it was really unique though it was really interesting but i mean and you know we we you show up and we talk through all the fork and all this. And I'm like, this is great. This is great. And, but I'm also in the back of my head. Like, I just want to ride it. And yeah. like, in my mind, I'm like, I want to challenge it. I want it to, you know, maybe not live up always because, you know, it's your, it's your baby, yeah, you know? Sure. And, and, uh, I'm going to say wonderful things about it. Totally. <laughs> totally. And, but it's all after we did the one run we did, I was like, I just want to go ride it more right. because <laughs> it reacts differently in such a positive way than, you're used to with maybe what you've written in the past. Yep. Um, and like, I just keep going back to compliance. Like it, it really forms and gives you like that little bit extra comfort in situations that maybe right now you don't realize your fork is binding more than you think. Yep. Um, traction's a huge one. Like we didn't ride a lot of turns today, but you know, when you hit a turn, you might not be realizing that your fork is fighting you a lot more than you think. Yeah. Um, and there was a few times today where like, you know, I purposely dove in really hard trying to like feel what was happening. And it was like, you kind of feel the fork sort of 
flex, I guess, mm-hmm. but the the hold and push out of it was really unique and and really good. Like it felt really awesome. Oh, um, yeah, I know. Wait, wait, let's yeah. let's just stop there. Yeah. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> That's the podcast. Listen, happens. I'll take. Yeah. <laughs> can we just? Can we, <laughs> um, and and yeah, yeah and uh, again. I will acknowledge, you know, we, we built a very sophisticated, well, we, our engineering team's amazing. They had everything to do with this. I had very little. Let me just start there. Um, great crew of people. They've done an amazing job. I just showed up and got to ride cool stuff. Um, but they built a torsional test rig, right? So we know, we'll acknowledge right now, we are not as torsionally stiff as a 38 millimeter conventional fork. Mm-hmm. No problem. I have no problem acknowledging that. We know exactly where that falls in the torsional category between 35, 36, 38 millimeter forks. This fork is a 36 millimeter lower. So we have a 44 millimeter upper and a 36 millimeter lower. Um, We know where it is from a torsional stiffness. It is not as stiff as a 38 um, or a Zeb. Uh, And we feel like that's a performance advantage. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we have the ability with the crown design and with the tube shapes, the taper of the tube, the wall thicknesses, all those things. That's a nice thing about ha- was nice about the aluminum is we went and made several different types of tubes and crowns like and steering tubes. We've tried all kinds of different things, um, that we tested in the lab. So we knew what they were doing and then we could ride them on trail and say, Oh wow, that's, that's horrible. Or mm-hmm. this is great. Or so we have the ability to I want people to realize we're acknowledging that you will grab it with your legs and it will twist mm-hmm. more than a standard fork. Mm-hmm. Yep. hundred yeah. percent. We'll also acknowledge we did that on purpose and the amount of movement that it has is very purposeful mm-hmm. and we could have made it stiffer. We could have made it, you know, it's, it's that thing where what's easier making it really stiff so that people can put it between their legs and then the product's not as good or really trying to get out in front of it and say, Hey, we know that's a topic mm-hmm. and we, we're willing to say that it's, it's not torsionally as stiff as other products on the market, mm-hmm. but we believe this makes the best performing product. Yeah. 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 I'd be, I hope at some point I get to spend more time on it. Yeah, for sure. Cause it is, it is, it is a unique feeling, you know? Yep. Um, yeah. Yep. Awesome. Cool. How does one get a hold of one? If they have 26 bucks burning a hole in their pocket. <laughs> push. 2,600 bucks. Yeah. Uh, pushindustries.com. Yeah. So, uh, you know, availability is going to be pretty limited this first year. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's, um, we're really focused on building this thing right. And so uh, we're doing doing the forks in really small batches. And so, yeah, you can reach out to us or any of our you know, partners around the globe and, uh, kind of, um, get on a list, I guess is how we'll do it at this point, you know, so we're kind of navigating that right now, but I, I do know that they're going to be, um, pretty hard to get initially and, uh, we'll try to scale as, as best we can. But for us, you know, like with everything, it's when we started off with the rear shock, started off slow and got to a place now where, you know, we, we have pretty good manufacturing and assembly you know, lines that, that do all that stuff. Uh, the fork's going to take some time and we value people's money. We know that when you buy one of our products, you're spending a lot more money than you would had you bought something else. And so our expectation of the customer's experience is extremely high. So we have a certain product expectation and we have a customer expectation because we know that what we're asking for is a lot of money. Um, and again, we acknowledge that, but we're going to provide the best product and the best customer experience. That's who we are. Cool. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> all in all, it was a fun day. And yeah. <laughs> it was good. I, I got to be in California during uh, the Colorado <laughs> winter and ride some bikes. So right. that was that was all good. Yeah, right. Hard to beat. Yeah. yeah. I have two yeah, smaller random questions. Yeah. Maybe to close out on. One, why no Kashima or lookalike? substance on the stanchions yep. and two idea. the um it's inverted yep. so you have guards on there yeah what do you say to people that are super afraid about scratching their stanchions every ride um from our experience you know we've been riding these things for a long time uh, the stan- the stanchion guards are there as a, a bit of protection but um we haven't had a like stanchion damage has not really been a big thing uh, maybe it's because we're not crashing a lot um, 
so the first thing is that the, the guards are there to protect the fork. Uh, they've done a, a, a really good job. Stanchions can be replaced, right? So we do have, you don't have to throw your fork away. You don't have to buy a whole upper assembly. If you scratch a stanchion, you can buy just a single stanchion and, and have that Sweet. replaced. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So again, that's part of like that service, modularity, all of those things. Uh, second is the tube coating is our kind of our take on it. So we have what's called micro XD. Um, that's what our shock bodies and reservoirs and shock shafts have been made, uh, uh, coated with for years. Uh, so for us, it's a very familiar process and it pr- produces, uh, what we feel are better results. So we're really, uh, confident in that coating. It's been on every 11, six since 2016. Sweet. And so that's what the stanchion tubes are actually. So the inner tubes or stanchion tubes are, are micro XD coated, um, which is a, yeah, a coating that's been great. And if you do scratch one, uh, we do have that replacement. Uh, another quick feature talking about the fork guards. So right now, um, I'm running no fender, uh, and I have just the cable hanger. So I have, um, the, the fork guards are threaded. You have a cable hanger to hold your front brake cable. And then we do have the option, uh, for a little loop brace that connects the two, um, fork guards so that you can apply, you can just zip tie or Velcro a traditional fender. Mm -hmm. So you can have a traditional rear mounted fender, which is, uh, just kind of makes things easy as well. Yep. Sweet. Cool. I'm good. Good to go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's go lock him in the bathroom. You can go take one. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I'll just get you guys another one. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's not a production color, by the way. That's mm-hmm. custom. And that's they're custom. and they're three D printed guards as yeah. well, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's yeah. yeah that, that's the thing. What you guys rode today is one of our longest term uh, prototypes. So yeah, this is uh, we're we're in full production now. But yeah, this fork has seen. A lot of different <laughs> rides, a lot of different places. And yeah. So. yeah, Jason smashed it pretty good today. Yeah. So now, yeah. yeah, thank you so time, much. Time to be retired. No, yeah. that's you guys. Appreciate that was super it. fun. Yeah, yeah. thanks, awesome. Darren. Peace. Okay, cheers. We're back, Darren. Biggest question: What took a year? We had a working prototype that Jason rode. We posted yeah. footage of it, all that. We had it in our hands. We were looking at it, yeah. super hyped. Oh, a couple months out. Who knows how long? Here we are, a year later. Can you kind of walk us through why it took so long? Yeah, honestly, um, it was a really big surprise. It comes down to one thing, which is, okay. uh, I'll have it right here, actually. The out, this outer tube. So um, the outer tube of this inverted fork is is uh, really complex. You know, carries a lot of load. Anyway, it's a, it's, it's a seemingly simple part, but it's actually a very technically advanced part. So long story short is um, you can't get that uh, that specific aluminum. You have to have custom drawn aluminum tubing to start with on that particular tube. Okay. Uh, and when you say outer tube, you're talking about like the upper fork leg that's pressed into the crowns correct. or bonded to the crowns or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the outer tube. So basically we have the stanchion tube um, and the outer tube or the yep. upper tube. And so for us, uh, that upper tube really uh, difficult part. So long story short, we struggled for at least a year trying to figure out how to get that tube made correctly into the specifications because we have a very a very strict specification on that outer tube. Um, we, we tried making it ourselves. We, tr- we went through a, a whole series of things until we were finally switched on to the oil and gas industry. And so I didn't realize that the oil and gas industry here in the U.S., uh, makes really high precision um, tubes and fittings that go on these big pumps and stuff. So anyway, we uh, we finally found a company. We found a couple of companies here in the U.S. that could could make the what we call the blank. So we need to start with a blank outer tube, and then it comes to push, and then we machine all the seal glands and uh, retaining ring grooves and bushings and all all the critical stuff. We we do the final finishing here. So we uh, through oil and gas found a vendor. Um, the vendor started working with them. They were making prototypes. Uh, everything was going great. And so we spent about a year uh, building the chassis and testing it before we ever rode a fork. The first thing was getting this outer tube made and then testing it, breaking it, you know, understanding uh, the structure. All good. So all the testing went great. Then we started riding the forks, obviously. So we did that for a year. Um, so we were testing and riding and oh, couldn't, everything was great. So in uh, November, it would have been November of uh, 22, 
So November of 22, we place an order for production tubes. We'd gone through several rounds of, uh, you know, making them 50 at a time with this particular vendor. And uh, everything was great. They knew what the expectations were. And in November, we sent an order over to have production run. At the same time, we were scheduling all of our internal production uh, here at Push. So that's all going swimmingly. I meet up with you guys in February, and we're riding the pre-production forks, and uh, back at Push, we're making parts. It, you know, we're getting ready for Sea Otter, obviously. You know, we go to Sea Otter and show this thing. And then the vendor for the outer tube comes back and says, we can't do it. It's, it's too big of a job. And it's like, like, like they can make the tubes, but the numbers were just too big for them. Correct. So, and we had been up front about what we were going to need. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, the long story short is they, they just basically said, Hey, we, we can't do it. Um, we tried to negotiate <laughs> with them and ultimately they said, it's just not going to happen, which left us, um, in a tough spot. And so we now had to find a new vendor an, or another vendor, a uh, new mm -hmm. vendor, and go through that whole process of qualifying the tube again, because it has, to, you know, we have to go through all of the testing process. And fortunately, the testing process is done in house. Our engineering mm -hmm. team had built all the test rigs and everything. But we had to find a new vendor, have prototypes made, put them on the test rigs, bend them, twist them, break them. And, you know, some of these tests are. You know, like we have a four aft uh, cycle test that is like a half a million cycles and it takes nine days straight. So the machine sits there and, you know, bangs this thing back and forth and it takes yep. nine days and then you make an adjustment and then you have to run it for nine. You know, it's there's you can't speed it up. So that process right. is the process. And so um, a big part of making the fork is is all the durability testing. So. Anyway, we had to go through that entire process again to qualify this new vendor and um, have those difficult conversations up front, which is this is what we actually need, et cetera. Um, and that's in a nutshell what happened is we basically had an outside supplier that was supplying the blanks. They pulled out and we had to go find somebody else and we had to take all of the necessary steps to qualify that outer tube again before we can move forward. Meanwhile, production here at Push is cranking at 110%. We're making mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of parts, not knowing if For we're going to have it. For the forks. Yeah. 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 So this, so like, again, you know, I look back to Sea Otter last year when we're showing this thing. I mean, our factory back here in Colorado is cranking. So we're showing this thing and the factory's cranking and we're expecting really like, you know, July it's going live. Oh, man. D didn't play out like that. <clears throat> okay, since you'd at least been through the process with the first vendor, yeah. did that make going through it again easier? And was the new company as capable as the other one? Uh, yeah, it did make it easier because we obviously had a, a wealth of knowledge going into it. So we knew exactly what we, all the pinpointing, right? We knew exactly what yeah. we needed to, to test. So that part definitely went faster. And uh, the new vendor is uh, a, a really large company. We honestly, um, you know, we always try to keep all of our vendors as local as possible. Yep. And we also like to work, well, we tend to work with smaller boutique companies. You know, we, we like to work with smaller companies because they tend to have more flexibility. The big companies tend to scare us because mm -hmm. lead times and sometimes there's many layers you have to go through in order to do business with them. But in this case, it was just like the decision was, you know what, we had this huge company that we were nervous about, but let's just let's just do it. And of course, there was some stumbling blocks because of their size. So we did run into those, you know, <laughs> our sense of urgency was not, <laughs> not their sense of urgency, obviously. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, they have uh, they have several departments. And so you talk with the sales team, which talks with an engineer, you know, there's just several. So. Mm -hmm. The good news is uh, they're a very large entity and uh, have proven to be a great supplier. And um, ultimately, working with a large supplier like this, when it did come to production, uh, they're just like, "Oh, this is, you know, easy like that." That's a, actually a Crazy. pretty small order for us. So okay, um, yeah. So it's all good. So we have uh, we have that behind us, and hmm. um, yeah, we have today we have uh, forks going into boxes. So.
can you talk about the number of forks? Like if, you know, that's none of our business, so be it. But, you know, you said, okay, you work with the first company on making 50, but then when it came to production levels, they're like, yeah, that's too big. Like, can you get into that? That's dude. That's like asking me how much money I make. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's the uh, internet. You got to be nosy now, even if it's not nice. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> you don't have to. I'm just curious. Yeah, I can't get into the specifics. Um, okay. But it's, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's we're no uh, it's, you know, we're not a Rock Shox or a Fox, obviously. Um, but sure. We do have a we do have um, a pretty consistent customer base for rear shocks and, um, yeah, we're. We're making a, a good number of them. That's for sure. Yeah, we've got sure. well, yeah. we've got a good number of them pre-ordered. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So. All right. Let's. Well, okay. Before we go into, I want to get the press release specifics out of your mouth so we can put it out there. But before we go into that, oh, look at that thing. <laughs> it's real. But besides the tubes. Yeah. Which I mean are the same. They're just made somewhere different. Was there anything else changed compared to what? we saw in the prototype version that that we wrote and, uh, and obviously besides like the 3d printed parts you had on the fork we saw and stuff but anything else different internally or structurally or anything like that in the last year no no everything was yeah we were good to go so basically what you rode uh that pre-production fork i mean obviously we refined the parts and like you said there's some still some 3d printed parts and so getting the production pieces but no all the guts and the dna and everything is is the same um colors you know we kind of refine the finishes and but refinements not not really anything changed from us a, a structural um no features no functionality like everything everything is the same because like i said we thought we were done you know so sure. when you guys rode that fork and when we talked a year ago um that was what we were going to market with uh yeah i mean we got a bunch more ride time on it since mm -hmm. since then which uh we already had a lot of riding on them so it's one of those things where we didn't need more riding but i guess it is comforting to know that we've spent a whole uh, you know a whole another season riding the forks mm -hmm. and um, allowing other people to ride them so i guess the one process is prior to you guys riding that fork uh, almost no one had ridden them outside of our our building mm -hmm. and so i think one thing that has changed since then is uh, more just I mean, we've had customers riding them. Like, just we've brought in customers to say, hey, you want to try this thing? Like, mm -hmm. go ride it. And so it's been nice to get more ride time on it. Um, and uh, But that's about it. But everything else is, it, it is the same fork. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Give us the full press release rundown of the fork. Travel, specs, <clears throat> standards, prices, all that good stuff. Since it's here, it's now. Yeah. So, um yeah, obviously, inverted fork, uh, really geared towards the enduro market. Um, travel is 140 to 170, internally adjustable, excuse me, internally adjustable. And um, I'd have to go back and listen to that previous interview, but, you know, it's the travel adjust system is really clever in the fact that it doesn't require uh, special tools or parts. So the, the internal pieces can just be adjusted in your garage or at the shop or whatever. Uh, obviously coil sprung right that's a big big thing and um, I think another big aspect of this fork is it was designed and developed from the ground up to be a coil fork air was never even in the conversation and so it has okay. a lot of refinements and a lot of things that are really focused we really feel like this is the first ever coil specific package that's been built um, 36 millimeter uh, stanchion tubes 44 millimeter upper tube um, traditional inch and a half tapered steer uh, uses a traditional uh, axle system, so the 15 uh, by 110 um, axle, so st <coughs> standard front hubs. We do have these really cool um, laser cut inserts for the axle lugs, so that you can um, so help center the wheel on a standard hub versus a torque cap. So it is torque cap compatible. Okay. Um, you know, we talked about the brake system. It uh, has a dual brake mount so you have 180 and 185 and 200 and 203 um, direct mount to the fork so you don't need adapters to run those if you have to run the bigger you know 220 adapter then you or 220 brake then you would run an adapter but other than that no adapters necessary okay. 
Um, yeah, it's sick. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's what everyone wants to know. How oh much? yeah. Yes, yeah, two thousand six hundred. Yeah. Okay. Two thousand six hundred cool. retail. Um, it is. You know, we make it, so it is a, a typical push product. You know, we make this thing in here in Colorado. Uh, they all are. You know, manufactured, hand built, custom. You know, tons of tuning options available for this thing. It's. It's really the ultimate the ultimate fork, you know, when it comes down to it. Do you know how many days it's been since you decided, yes, we're moving forward with this, with this thing? Do you have any idea? Yeah, so um, November ticked off four years. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. so we're over four years, okay. <laughs> yeah, so in November, November was four years since we started. Um, so we've been, we've been playing with a number of fork ideas and then uh, um, it, four years, that marks the, the decision, like here's our package, here's the, let's start up the CAD work and you know, like take it from these theoretical sketches and kind of the project board to actually making things, or like designing things. And so, yeah, I saw that the first kind of CAD drawings were released um, four years ago in November. So we're past that wow. mark at this point. All right, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> And it's, and honestly, it was the first, I think I mentioned this before, but the first year and a half was just building the structure and breaking them, you know, before mm -hmm. we, I mean, it took us a year and a half to, to, to design the upper assembly and, um, you know, just figure out like, is this thing safe to ride? What does it take to bend a steering tube? What's it take to, you know, unbond the crown? You know, like all of these are questions that we had to answer. So that's cool. a... So it was like you have all the design and engineering. That's one thing, but then you have all of that testing. Um, so the first thing we designed, obviously, is the upper assembly, just so we could figure out how to make it work. And then, hmm. which is another thing, we just you know we never talked about. But here's a little tidbit of information. I will. So one more specification that we'll talk about sure. is the fork uh, bushing system. So uh, this fork uses fixed bushings. Um, there's been a lot of speculation that the fork uses floating bushings. It does not. Mm. Um, but I will say that all of the first forks did use floating bushings. And so mm. the original design was to use floating bushings. And we went through several iterations of that. We really felt like that was going to be a key component to the structure. And so all of the first forks used a floating bushing system. And for people, um, you know, a, a traditional mountain bike fork, the fork bushings are pressed into the lower leg. So the fork bushings are pressed into the lower, lower leg and they're static, and then the tubes uh, sliding, slide in and out. With a motorcycle fork, the uh, one bushing is fixed, is pressed into the outer tube, and then the other one is on the stanchion tube and floats. So as the fork changes travel, the bushing moves with it. So you always have this varying overlap. And we thought that was uh, going to be necessary to make this thing work. And so all of our original uh, prototypes, the first three generations, had flo various floating bushing designs. We went through, oh my gosh, I couldn't, I mean, if you told me it was 25 different iterations, I'd believe you, um, wow. trying to make the floating bushing work. And ultimately, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't get it to do what we wanted it to do. And so then we struck a different prototype with the fixed bushings, which is the upper tubes, the bushings are pressed into the upper tubes. Okay. And that was like a home run right out of the gate. So taking the inverted design, and it really came down to the fact that uh, the reason motorcycles get away with floating bushings is because they're filled with oil, like solid, solidly filled with oil. And the oil acts as a bearing it's because oil is not compressible. Um, any gaps between the tubes and the, and the floating bushing are, bushing are taken up with, with oil. And so acting as a bearing, so it's a solid surface. And with a mountain bike, because we use lubricating fluid, uh, we could just never get the bushing to behave the way it needs to. Hmm. And so I'm, I'm not saying that it can't be done um, in the future, but I can say that it, the benefits of trying to get it to work uh, are just are outweighed by, I'm, how do I say that? There's just such a small benefit to it in a mountain bike single crown fork that it doesn't really make sense to even move forward with the development. So, hmm. 
So one thing that has been speculated is that this uses floating bushings. I can say that we exhausted that and ultimately landed on a fixed bushing system, which is far superior in uh, all performance aspects. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Good to know. In hindsight, would you do it again? <laughs> no. Really? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's it's been really it's been a really difficult um, thing for the company being so small. You know, being such a yeah. small company, it's been a big thing. You know, we really bit off a lot with this. And uh, I was even joking the other day as I'm, I was down on the assembly floor and watching like you know customer version forks being built, and uh, I was laughing and joking with one of our engineers. It's like we have no business doing this because. It is such an advanced piece of equipment, and we are such a small team of people. You know, it's like, mm. man, we really don't have any business. But we're really passionate. You know, you know that. Um, we're yeah. we're a passionate team of people, and um, we only want to build the best stuff. And the challenges have been tremendous um, with this with this product. Uh, but the performance, I mean, it's such a. It's, I'm obviously biased, but it's such a unique. Mm product it has been really cool over the last um, few months having customers you know we've taken them out and had customers riding them on their bikes and just seeing their reaction you know that's been i guess that's been worth it all the pain and suffering has been erased by just riding with some customers and coming down the first few descents and just looking at them staring at it you know and and getting their first impressions and so it's such a such a different product that we're really really excited about it so would i do it again yes <laughs> would i do it differently hell yes <laughs> <laughs> hindsight right yeah but we didn't have anything to go oh, sorry we didn't have anything to go off of i think the you know right. what makes this so groundbreaking is you know this is inverted forks have been attempted a number of times over the years and uh it's you know we've proven you can do it you know it, it took it took a lot but yeah so anyway how have customers reacted like aside from stoke and praise have there have they had any responses that may have surprised you or anything um no the the responses have been what we were hoping for which is good mm -hmm. uh, but i will tell you one kind of anecdotal story that's that's pretty great uh we have a local customer that has um had the various inverted forks over the years, you know, and he's one of the guys that, you know, oh, I had a Maverick, you know, Duke or what, you know, I had this fork, had that fork, and they're all twisty and they don't ride good. And um, anyway, so I ran into him on the trail a couple of years ago and he saw the prototype on my bike and was immediately like, whoa, that thing's crazy. You know, it's, I really want an inverted fork. And he's like, here, let me twist it. And I'm like, no, dude, you can't, can't even get near this thing. Yep. And, uh, so he was kind of surprised at my reaction, like, no, you can't touch it, you can't do anything. And so um, anyway, over the next, the, the next year, I would run into him, you know, every once in a while. So probably five, six times over the year I ran into him and, and I always had a different version of the prototype or a different fork and he was so interested in, in twisting it, you know, because everybody uh -huh. wants to grab the front wheel and twist the handlebars. Yeah. So uh, fast forward to uh, last fall, basically said, um, uh, hey, do you want to try one of these forks? And of course he's like, yeah, absolutely. And I said, the mm -hmm. only way I'll do it is if, you know, you give me the bike, we'll install the fork, I'll meet you at the trailhead and you can't touch the fork. You have to agree to just ride it. And so he's like, yeah, a hundred percent. So uh, we started up the first climb and then we come down the first descent and this first descent that we do is maybe like 14 minutes long. And so we get to the bottom and he's just, you know, grinning ear to ear. And I was like, what do you think? He goes, man, it's just incredible. It's like the stiffest thing I've ever ridden. And it's just the performance, you know, everything about it. Okay, great. Yeah. And I said, okay, cool. So now twist it. And uh, <laughs> he's like, no, I don't, I don't need to. I'm good. I just wrote it. It's super stiff. And I was like, no, I like, I want you to twist it. No, no, I'm good. I said, listen, I, I need you to do this for me. Uh -huh. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so he gets off. And we're with a few other riders and two of the guys that were with us didn't know why we were doing that. They were just mm -hmm. like, what, what is he doing? So he gets off and he grabs the handlebars and twists the front wheel. And he looks up at me and he's just like, wait a minute. Like it, it does twist. And I was like, yeah, it does. Yeah. And I said, you know, it's like, what do you think? Well, 
but it's so stiff on the trail. It's like, yeah, because that test is just, you know, if we could get, you know, if we could just get you to ride it, <laughs> like ride it before you twist it. And, um, you know, and we've, we've talked about that. That's one of the hurdles that we're going to have right. to overcome is don't twist it, just ride it. Because we'll yep. tell you right up front that if it is not, if you do that test with a traditional fork and do that test with our fork, ours is going to move more than a uh, traditional fork, you know, it, but that yep. test doesn't mean anything on the trail. So anyway, that was a really great one. So that was, that was one of those where, you know, he just didn't care. He was just like, cool. Like I, he's put, he put so much, fo in his mind, he had put so much focus on that twist movement yeah. that that's the make it, or that, that dictates whether or not the fork's good. But having ridden it first, he was like, oh, I guess that test doesn't actually mean anything. So yeah and it's it's cool he's had experience on other inverted forks because i'd imagine most people haven't at all yeah. yeah yeah i mean it's very few right i mean there's not a lot of people and especially at this at this uh level you know like having a real right. enduro fork that'll take a punch um yep. and so there's been very few offerings which was the challenge for us in developing it you know it's not like we had a bunch of stuff we could ride to compare it to um yep. other than i mean the intend fork was really the only one we could get our hands on that was you know, uh, targeted towards this category and that, you know, that's a very different product than what we've built. So, yep. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Since we had that first interview and covered all the main stuff, we'll end with a fun one right here. Yeah. We just asked this question on our forum. What one industry standard would you change that exists right now? And you can pick more than one if you want. <clears throat> well, knowing what we know today, um, steering tube. So um, all the fork manufacturers know that the current steering tube is not adequate. So an inch and a half tapered steering tube is not adequate for a single crown fork. And it's, uh, it's kind of the, um, the thing that is dragging down enduro category forks. So <laughs> if we could, if we could the stiffness, what the stiffness like is it not is, robust enough? Yeah, I mean the interface between the crown and the steering tube, the steering tube diameter, all of that is. I I would I'd be willing to bet that if you got the top, you know, ten fork engineers together and asked them about the steering tube, they all would go. They'd all cringe. They'd be like, oh yeah, we wish it could be bigger diameter we wish it we had different overlap we wish the configuration was different because um that you know again going back to that kind of like oh inverted forks you twist them it's like no the steering tube and crown interface so that's why when you look at you know what obviously our fork has a very unique steering tube and crown interface um, mm -hmm. the overlap of the crown the, the design of it it's very unique and so yeah one industry standard that i think could be improved greatly knowing what we know today is uh, that that steering tube interface and uh, making the steering tube larger diameter. You know, we kind of, we joke when we see, you know, like a 1.8 tapered standard, like 1.8, like, but turns mm -hmm. out, like, man, that makes a lot of sense because there's so much loading. You know, when we have a dual crown fork, it's completely different. Dual crown, yep. totally different story. But when we're talking about Supported a single all crown over, fork, yeah. Yeah, and one of the things that we did... Um, we also thought that uh, having, so our first, all of our first forks, by the way, here's another little secret. All mm -hmm. of our first forks didn't use the 1.5 tapered steering tube. They used mm -hmm. a, a crown extension, um, similar, there's a brand out there that, that um, was doing that and then no one else was doing it. And we thought, huh, it seems like that would be the way to go. And mm -hmm. so originally we used a slightly smaller steerer tube that had more, like the crown had an extension built into it. And it turns out um, that was not the best way to go. The reason why like Fox and RockShox were using the 1.5 is that really is the best from a stiffness and strength, et cetera. Okay. Um, but anyway, yeah, industry standard steering tube. If we could make that steering tube bigger diameter um, and you know maybe a 1.8 to a 1.5 taper or something like that. man if we can make the the steering tube has such a huge impact on the forks performance when in a single crown okay interesting yeah. wow yeah. yeah and that's the thing like i'm you know i can say that from a fork perspective you know the axle standards are 
you know, adequate, you know, like the axle standards seem just fine. Yep. Um, yeah, it really comes down to that 1.5 steering tube. Hmm. So, all right. That's so, give it, so if the industry does a big s- switch after this conversation, can somebody please just give me credit for, for saying it publicly? <laughs> We need, All right. we need we'll count stand. it. It'll be documented. <laughs> I know they've showed the 1.8 steering tubes at Taipei mm-hmm. show and stuff, but yep. if it actually progresses, can I just get credit, please? All right. Sounds good. <laughs> we'll count it. <laughs> hey, thanks. Yeah, you got it. Pushindustries.com, right? Pushindustries.com. Yeah, this has been a it's been a fun ride waiting and yeah. texting you every other week. Is it ready? Can we put the show up yet? Is it ready? <laughs> and I'm glad we finally can. Well, and, the, and the best part was when you were late last year and you're joking. It's like, dude, it's going to be a year. I'm like, no, it definitely won't be a year. Well, it turns out, yeah, it's a yeah, year. It's about a year. <laughs> yep. Round numbers. Nice and even. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Darren. Appreciate yeah. it. Super appreciate the time, as always. <laughs>